Hello everyone, let's continue in this series. And in this video, we will explore some of the main key concepts of the core container of Spring Framework, Beans, Spring Core, and Spring Context. First of all, we need to understand what beans are. In the Spring Framework, a bean is a fundamental building block representing an object managed by the Spring IOC container, or inversion of control. Beans are the Java objects that form the backbone of a Spring application. These objects are instantiated, assembled, and managed by the Spring IOC container. Inversion of control is a broad concept where the control flow is inverted or handed over to a framework or container. In the case of Spring, it specifically refers to the inversion of control in managing beans and their dependencies. So, beans are essentially instances of Java classes, and these classes can be simple, plain old Java objects or more complex classes with business logic. And the Spring IOC container is responsible for managing the life cycle of beans, creating them, injecting their dependencies, and disposing of them when they are no longer needed. But we will talk about this more in detail later. Spring IOC manages the life cycle of beans based on the configuration provided that can be done in different ways. It's often specified using XML configuration, and here we can specify the class and properties for a bean. Or Java-based configuration, which involves using configuration annotated classes and declaring beans using bean annotated methods, Java annotations, or Java-based configuration classes. Also specific annotations like component, service, repository, and controller can be used to mark classes as beans. This metadata informs the Spring container about how to create and manage beans. Now, there are two types of IOC containers. Bean Factory, which is the simplest container in the Spring IOC container hierarchy. It provides the fundamental features for managing and creating beans. It uses lazy loading, meaning that it only instantiates a bean when it's requested. This can be beneficial in scenarios where resources need to be conserved, and not all beans are required to be loaded at the application startup. In addition to that, it's suitable for resource-constrained environments or applications where memory usage needs to be minimized. To use Bean Factory, you typically configure it with an XML file or Java configuration class, and in code, you retrieve beans from Bean Factory as needed. On the other hand, Application Context is a more advanced container compared to Bean Factory. It extends Bean Factory and provides additional features and functionality. It tends to use eager loading, meaning that it eagerly creates and initializes beans at application startup. This can result in faster access to beans when they are needed. It includes all the features of Bean Factory and adds more advanced capabilities such as event propagation, AOP integration, and declarative mechanisms for Bean instantiation. Application Context also supports loading resources from various locations, including the class path, file system, and URLs. And it also supports the publishing and handling of application-wide events, allowing different components to communicate and respond to events. So, in summary, Application Context is a more feature-rich and capable extension of Bean Factory, and the choice between them depends on the specific requirements of the application. Getting back to the life cycle of a bean in Spring, which consists of the following phases. First, instantiation, in which the bean is created by the Spring IOC container. Then, dependencies and properties are injected into the bean. And in initialization, if the bean implements the initializing bean interface or defines a custom initialization method, it's called after property population. And then the bean is used by the application. And last, if the bean implements the disposable bean interface or defines a custom destruction method, it's called when the application shuts down. Let's talk about another key concept in Spring Boot, dependency injection. This deals with how components, or beans, obtain their dependencies. Instead of the bean creating its dependencies, the dependencies are injected into the bean. With this, components are not tightly bound to their dependencies, and this promotes flexibility and maintainability. In addition, components can be reused in different contexts without modification. 
So assuming we have a set of beans and there is a bean that has dependency on another bean, first, beans are registered in the IOC container when the application is started. And once beans are registered with the container, Spring uses dependency injection to wire them together. This means that dependencies required by a bean are injected into it by the container. Now let's see a simple demo of dependency injection in Spring Boot. First thing, when you use dependency injection in Spring, you typically don't need to declare which type of IOC container to use explicitly. Instead, Spring automatically manages the creation and injection of dependencies using its application context. We start with the app config class. We define it as a configuration class using the configuration annotation. And let's have a simple method to retrieve a message. Now by using the bean annotation, we explicitly declare this method as responsible for creating and configuring this bean. After that, let's create a controller class, which will then need to be injected by that bean that we declared. We declare it as a RESTful web service using the REST controller annotation. This annotation is primarily used in Spring MVC applications to create web controllers that handle HTTP requests and produce HTTP responses in the form of JSON, XML, or other formats commonly used in RESTful APIs. We need now to have the text message to be retrieved when we call the web service. We need the constructor, and now we can inject that bean from appconfig through the constructor. and we need a method to return that welcome message. Now we use this method to handle HTTP GET requests when we hit the main page of this application. So we use GET mapping annotation, and here we define the root URL path to return the response to the client, which is the welcome message. Now we run the application, and we go to the local host URL. and we can see the message that we are injecting here. One more thing. This is a constructor injection that we have made here, in which Spring automatically identifies the constructor with a single parameter and resolves the dependency by injecting the appropriate bean of type appconfig when creating instances of controller. Here we can also explicitly annotate the constructor with auto-wired to indicate to Spring that dependency injection should be performed on the constructor. Here the auto-wired annotation is optional and when there is only one constructor. However, this should be explicitly used in other injection types. So we also have field injection as another type. Here we use auto-wire to inject dependencies directly into class fields. However, field injection is generally discouraged due to issues with testing, maintainability and encapsulation. We also have setter injection by providing setter methods in the class to set dependencies with auto-wired annotations on the setter methods. This approach is more flexible than field injection and allows for better encapsulation and testability. So auto-wired performs injection based on the type of the dependency. And if there is exactly one bin of the required type in the container, Spring injects it into the annotated field or method parameter. And if there are multiple beans of the same type, Spring may use additional qualifiers or annotations to disambiguate which bean to inject. Now let's talk about initialization and destroy hooks. The initialization hooks are methods that are invoked by the Spring IOC container after a bean has been instantiated and its properties have been set. These methods are annotated with POST construct. Initialization hooks are commonly used to perform tasks 
such as initializing resources or connections, performing data setup or validation, or preparing the bin for use. We can also implement the initializing bin interface as another way of using initialization hooks. On the other hand, destruction hooks are invoked before a bin is destroyed and it's annotated with pre-destroy. So this is used for releasing resources or connections, closing open files or streams, and cleaning up temporary data. And the same with initializing hooks, we can also here implement the disposable bean interface instead. By default, beans are single-tone instances with a Spring IOC container. This means that there is only one instance of a bean, and it's shared by all components that request it. While single-tone is the default scope, Spring supports various bean scopes, such as prototype, in which a new instance of the bean is created each time it's requested from the container. This means that every time you request a bean, Spring creates a new instance of that bean. In addition, prototype beans are not managed by the container after they are created and it's the responsibility of the caller to manage their lifecycle. Another scope is request. Request scope creates a new instance of the bean for each HTTP request. This means that every HTTP request receives its own instance of the bean. Similar to request scope, Session scope creates a new instance of the bean for each HTTP session. So each user session in a web application receives its own instance of the bean. Application scope creates a single instance of the bean per self-led context or web application. Here, the same instance of the bean is shared across all users and sessions within the web application. And last one is WebSocket scope that creates a new instance of the bean for each WebSocket connection. Now let's finally check resource and inject annotations. The resource annotation is used for dependency injection and by default, it injects dependencies by name. You can specify the name of the bean to be injected using the name attribute of the annotation. If no matching bean is found by name, it falls back to type-based injection. So if multiple beans of the same type are present in the container, you can qualify the injection by specifying the bean name in the name attribute. The inject annotation injects dependencies based on their type. If there are multiple beans of the same type, additional qualifiers may be needed to specify which bean to inject. And unlike resource, inject doesn't provide a way to specify injection by name. It focuses only on injection by type. So inject annotation provides type safety during dependency injection as it relies on type-based injection. So in summary, if you need to qualify the injection by name, or if you are working in a Java environment where resource is preferred, you can use resource annotation. Otherwise, if you prioritize type-based injection and type safety, then injection annotation is a better choice. Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.